Welcome back to Timeline of World History. I'm Dan and I will be reading this, but it is really the work of Shane Sowersby. He says it has been a while, but if his memory serves him correctly, we ended the last episode in Ain Ghazal, Jordan, another perfect example of a Neolithic community practicing agriculture and creating beautiful figurines. Well, it is time to move. To the beginning of the 7th millennium BC. During this period, agriculture spread further from Anatolia into parts of southeast Europe. The cow was added to sheep and goats in farming communities, and the use of pottery became more common. But we start our episode in China, where its own separate Neolithic continues at a pace. The Pelagan culture, 7000 to 5000 BC, was a group of Neolithic communities situated in the Yilu River Basin in Henan province, China. Existing from 7000 to 5000 BC, over 100 sites have been identified, with nearly all of them in a compact area of approximately 100 square kilometers south of the river. Discovered in 1977, Archaeologists suggest that the culture was egalitarian with little political organization. Agriculture was practiced by cultivating millet and by raising pigs, cattle and poultry. People hunted wild boar and fished for carp using nets made from hemp fibers. It is one of the oldest cultures in China to make pottery. This pot you see here, this red pot characteristic of the culture had two small ear handles used for cooking and storing grain. Like most Neolithic cultures, it had separate residential and burial areas. Common artifacts include stone arrowheads, spearheads and axe heads. Also stone tools such as chisels, awls and sickles for harvesting grain and a broad assortment of pottery items. Jiahu, 7000 to 5700 BC. Staying in China, Jiahu was a Neolithic settlement situated on the central plain near the Yellow River, 14 miles north of Wuyang in Henan province. Settled in approximately 7000 BC, it was surrounded by a moat and covered an area of 55,000 square meters. It was a highly complex and organized Neolithic society with populations ranging from 250 to 800 people. Discovered by Xu Shi in 1962, excavation of the site did not occur until the 1980s. Most of the site has not been excavated today in 2016. Excavation of burial sites and rubbish pits yielded evidence about the lives of the people. Researchers from Henan Provincial Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology led by Shang Shugong from University of Science and Technology of China, have carried out research at the site for decades. Shang's team excavated portions of the site in seven stages, each stage taking two to three years. That's a pretty big project. A large portion of the site was excavated in the first two phases between 1983 and 1987. Findings of the first two phases were published in the journal Antiquity. Numerous tools of bone, bone, stone and pottery have been identified at Yahu. A stone sickle blade was secured to a wooden handle in order to harvest grain. Baskets woven from wild grass were used to carry grain. Remains of a spinning loom indicated the production of cloth from hemp fibers. Many tool and utensils included three-legged earthenware cooking pots with tight-fitting lids and a variety of stone implements including arrowheads, barbed harpoons, spades, axe, awls and chisels. Basically tools we are familiar with today. These improved weapons and the fact that the settlement was surrounded by a moat provided the settlers with an ideal defense against incursions from any nomadic hunters that might want to steal the produce. However, there is no evidence of any armed conflict and human remains showed no signs of a violent death. This would explain the substantial growth in population over the years with plenty of food to keep the inhabitants happy. 
seemed that this was a very nice place to live. The most significant find was the discovery of playable flutes made from bones of red crowned cranes. Discovered in the late 1980s, they represent the oldest playable musical instrument yet discovered. 33 flutes, 20 of them intact after all this time, were found between 7 and 10 inches in length. It is plausible that ancient flutes were made from bamboo and ancient myths did describe them. Trouble is, if flutes were made of bamboo, they would have decayed long ago. However, if you remember back to episode 2 of Timeline of World History, the actual oldest flute, albeit not playable, was found in a cave in Germany dated to approximately 41,000 BC. Flutes were probably used prob for entertainment or ceremonial purposes. They were cut, smoothed, polished and drilled with a row of holes on one side. One broken flute was repaired by drilling 14 tiny holes along the breakage and then tying sections together with hemp string. Pretty ingenious. Inhabitants cultivated both millet and rice. Whilst millet was common to Peligang, rice was unique to Yahu. Rice cultivation is the earliest and most northerly found at this stage in history. The fact that the area was swampy made rice much more abundant than the drier conditions of millet further north. The rice was used in the fermentation process with honey, hawthorn fruit and or grapes to produce an alcoholic beverage. Party time! We know this from residues found in several pottery vessels. Hick! Animals that were domesticated included dogs, cattle and pigs. In addition, people hunted for rabbit, deer, roe deer and even crocodiles? Yikes! Had no idea that crocodiles were in China. Over 300 burials with offerings were found in connections to phases 2 and 3. Objects range from pottery to tortoise shells varying between individuals, providing evidence of an early specialization in labor, including farmers, hunters, potters, musicians, and even a tribal priest. Most burials were in earthen pits with infants buried in earthenware jars. As was common in Neolithic cemeteries, burials were set aside and separated from residential areas, a bit different to buried your love, burying your loved ones underneath your house, as we saw in an earlier episode. Some of the burials overlapped, probably in relations to one another, a bit like the practice we use today in our cemetery, cemeteries. The final unique thing about Yahu was the discovery of 11 markings on bone and tortoise shells that are believed to be some of the earliest evidence of proto-writing dated to between 6600 and 6200 BC. Some of these symbols have a striking similarity to characters developed by the Shang dynasty on oracle bones in approximately 1200 BC. Trouble is, such a long period in time between the two makes it unlikely there was any connection and unless there are more discoveries of Yahoo symbols we need to be more convinced that these are indeed the earliest forms of writing in the world. If so, this would be approximately 3000 years before the current candidate for oldest writing in the world, which is of course the Sumerians. Archaeologists are divided about the relationship between Yahoo and Pelagang. Most agree that Yahoo was part of the Pelagang culture due to its many similarities. Few point to differences, believing that Yahoo shared many cultural characteristics with its neighbor, but that it was a separate culture. Yahoo was situated many kilometers south of Pelagang, so getting there would have involved several days of walking. After all, people had not yet started to ride a horse or <laughs> drive a car. Mirgar! 7000 to 2600 BC. Moving west now to Pakistan. In the last episode we mentioned the possible forerunner of the Indus Valley civilization, which was Birana in India, dated to 7500 BC. However, that theory is controversial, as some people think it is more to do with Hindu nationalism than anything else. So before the discovery of Birana, Mergar was seen as the precursor of the Indus Valley civilization. Mergar is situated near the Bolan Pass 
in Balochistan, west of the Indus River Valley. It was discovered in 1974 by French archaeologist. Oh, I, I, I'm gonna butcher French here. Jean Francois and Catherine Yarish before being excavated continuously between 1974 and 1986 and from 97 to 2000. About 32,000 artifacts from six mounds have so far been discovered. The earliest settlement, dated to 7000 BC, was a small farming village of 495 acres. It was Neolithic, without the use of pottery. It was developed by semi-nomadic people living in simple mud buildings with four internal subdivisions, cultivating six row wheat and barley and keeping sheep, goats and cattle. They stored grain in granaries, fashioned tools with copper ore and lined their baskets with bitumen. The oldest ceramic figurines in South Asia were found at this settlement. They occurred during the full period and were pre prevalent before pottery managed to appear. Early figurines were simple and did not show any intricate features. As time went on they grew in sophistication and by 4000 BC they began to show the characteristic hairstyles and prominent breasts. Many of the female figurines were shown holding babies and have been interpreted as depictions of a mother goddess. However, some scholars prefer the term female figurines with likely cultic significance. Too much of a mouthful if you ask me. Let us stick with mother goddess. Between 5500 and 3500 BC, people began to use pottery. Taking advantage of the introduction of the potter's wheel in 4800 BC, much evidence of manufacturing have be, has been found, including production of glazed faience beans, beads and the first button seals made from terracotta and bone with geometric designs. Ornaments of seashell, limestone, turquoise, lapis lazuli and sandstone have been found showing that trade occurred as far away as present-day Badakhshan in Afghanistan. Technology increased with stone and copper drills, updraft kilns, large pit kilns and copper melting crucibles. However, we are getting ahead of ourselves as the Copper Age has yet to feature in our story. One other noticeable feature of Mergar was the discovery in 2001 of the remains of two men that had evidence of the drilling of human teeth in a living person. Therefore, these people had knowledge of proto-dentistry. The fact that they used stone tools and of course no anesthetic until Victorian times showed that these people must have a huge tolerance for pain. Ouch! Mergar would continue to fl flourish until 2600 BC when the emergence of the urbanized phase of the Indus Valley civilization occurred, but more on that in later episodes, much more. So time to go to Greece. The Fan of History podcast will be talking a lot about Greece in upcoming episodes for the rest of this year, but this is way before that, because this is Neolithic Greece of 7000 BC. So whilst the Neolithic was taking shape in China and Pakistan, Europe had yet to feel the benefit of agriculture, that is, until now. The exploitation of wild food resources played a limited role in the Greek Neolithic. The economy could be described as being agro-pastoral, farming, stock-rearing and herding, with no emphasis on hunting except for fishing on the islands. Settlements were concentrated on fertile alluvial and colluvial loose sediments at the bottom of hillside soils. As these soils were well watered and could be easily tilled by humans, no draft animals were needed or artificial irrigation required to any degree. There is no evidence of the presence of donkeys, horse or oxen, nor does Neolithic architecture in Greece include any large-scale irrigation works. Villagers were, villages were occupied throughout the year and for long periods of time as evidenced by numerous mound sites located in Macedonia, Thessaly and central Greece. There is evidence of widespread trade in utilitarian goods such as stone tools as well as exotics like shells and metals in later periods. However, there is no evidence of any social stratification 
or monumental architecture during the period of Neolithic Greece. As home to some of the very first Neolithic communities on mainland Europe, the fertile plain of Thessaly in North Greece could be termed the cradle of European civilization. Small farming communities began to emerge in approximately 7000 BC, gathering together in small villages of wattle and daub huts. One such example is Argissa, which was excavated by Vladimir Milicic of the University of Heidelberg in the 1950s. It contained evidence that people were cultivating wheat and keeping herds of goat, sheep and cattle. Settlement consisted of six pit huts with sunken pebble floors containing heat, hearts, presumably for warmth and cooking. Some have suggested that these floor levels eventually rose over the years and the huts became buildings with floors at ground level rather than subterranean. Others consider such a development unlikely. We also know that these people kept dogs for either working purposes or for company, collected seashells to carve into beads and bracelets and traveled to trade goods with nearby settlements. They also seem to have the time to create terracotta figurines from wet clay. Three ancient Neolithic terracotta figures dating to between 6800 and 5300 BC all display at least one element of exaggerated features of the abdomen, buttocks and thigh normally associated with Paleolithic and Neolithic idols. One shows only the torso displaying possible pregnancy. Second shows a figure with arms held by the side and the third shows a seated overweight figure with hands resting on her thighs. Their beliefs and the god they worshipped are not known. Perhaps these figures offer a clue. We can only guess whether they represent ancestors, primordial gods or fertility figures. But their popularity shows how important these were to Neolithic Greece. One other factor of this period was the emergence of the earliest domesticated pigs in Europe. The research by Durham University analyzed DNA from ancient and modern pig remains, suggesting that the migration of an expanding Middle Eastern population, who brought domesticated plants, animals and pottery styles with them, actually led to the local domestication of the European wild boar. Research funded by Wellcome Trust, Leverham Trust, Arts and Humanities Research Council and Smithsonian Institution show that within 500 years after local domestication of European wild boar, new domestics completely replaced Middle Eastern pigs that had arrived in Europe as part of the spread of agriculture. The research is part of an ongoing research project based at Durham University that explores roles of animals in reconstructing early farming, ancient human migration and past trade and exchange networks around the world. Okay, now it's time to talk about the Neolithic subpluvial period from 7000 to 3000 BC. Finally, what was the climate like at the beginning of the 7th millennium BC? Well, it became much wetter. It became much wetter in North Africa from 7000 to 3000 BC in a period known as the Neolithic subpluvial. It produced a fertile climate that supported a savanna type of ecosystem. Animals normally associated with the Sahel region south of the Sahara were in abundance, including elephant, giraffe and various other grassland and woodland animals. Humans began to settle in the Nile Valley in the Sudan and in Sahara. Usage of rafts, boats, weirs, traps, harpoons, nets, hooks, line and sinkers enabled humans to exploit the resources in fish, waterfowl, freshwater mollusks, rodents, hippos and yet again crocodiles. The local development of pottery to store and heat liquids resulted in a revolution in food styles consisting of soup, fish stew and porridge. Investigations in Sudan by British archaeologist Anthony Arkell during World War II described the late Stone Age settlement on a sandbank of the Blue Nile that was 12 feet higher than today. In the lush savanna, antelopes grazed amongst the large expanse, expanse of seed-bearing grasses as evidenced by bones found in middens. 
These people lived on fish and Arkell concluded that rainfall at the time was at least three times more than today. Physical characteristics from skeletons, uh, skeletal, skeletal remains suggested that these people were related to modern Nilotic peoples. Radiocarbon dating established Arkell's site to be between 7000 and 5500 BC. Arkell inferred a common fishing and hunting culture spread by people right across Africa at about the latitude of Khartoum at the time when the climate was so different that it was not a desert. In the 1960s, archaeologist Gabriel Camps investigated remains of a hunting and fishing community dating to approximately 6700 BC in South Algeria. These people, who made wavy lime pottery, were African rather than Mediterranean in origin and showed definite signs of cultivation of grain crops as opposed to the gathering of wild grains. Human remains found by archaeologists in the year 2000 at a site known as Gobero in northeastern Niger represented a preserved record of human habitations and burials from the Kifian 7700 to 6200 BC and the Tinerian 5200 to 2500 BC cultures. So there we have it. We are slowly mowing away from hunting and gathering to a predominantly agricultural society. Obviously, there are areas where agriculture had not yet reached, such as the rest of Europe, America, large parts of Africa, but it will slowly come. And to be honest, would you want to spend all day trying to hunt a gazelle when there is a delicious stew waiting on the fire and beer on hand? Ah, I thought so. Next time, we will wrap up the rest of the millennium by looking at further Neolithic cultures in Southeastern Europe, Middle East and China, as well as possibly the first cultures to emerge in Northern Iraq. So until next time, goodbye from the fan of history and timeline of world history. This has been the work of Shane Soversby and I'm Dan, the fan of history.